Welcome back to Book View Now, here at the end of a very long day, and we're capping it off with a wonderful writer, and a, I'll call you a friend, right? Absolutely. Colin McCann, his new book is, uh, is Letters to a Young Writer. He's well known as the, as the author of the novels, uh, including the National Book Award winning Let the Great World Spin, Transatlantic, and more recently, the story collection, 13 Ways of Looking. Welcome to you. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here. So what is this book, Letters to a Young Writer? What are you, what, what are you doing? Well, Rilke wrote Letters to a Young Poet. Famously. Um, famously. Yeah. And um, I was asked to, to have an online presence by my publishers. And I thought, oh, I don't really want to do that. Or, and, but then I said, well, maybe every week I'll post a, a little bit of advice to a, a young writer. And it sort of uh, took off. And I did it um, every week for uh, 52 weeks last year and so they decided well they're going to put it out as a as a little book and i think it's the sort of thing that i would have liked to have gotten myself as a, a, a as yeah. a younger writer although you know i don't always follow my own advice well you teach I right teach. so you're used to sort of yes talking about these things I, and i love teaching and, th and there's always that debate about whether you can teach writing or yes. not but i think i teach i hope i teach the virtue of fire and stamina and desire and perseverance. I'm not so sure that I can teach people how to, you know, uh, write dialogue or create plot or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But if I can get them and grab them by the scruff of the neck and say, you can do this. And if I see that fire in their eyes, that's when I think I, 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 know, I know a writer. So they have to have that sort of cocktail of talent and, and, and real and motivation as well. I mean, you, you say in the, in the beginning of the book that on the first day of class, you tell your students, you won't be able to teach them anything. That's right. But you clearly do. Well, I, I, yeah, but I, I wanted to, to, to destroy the expectation that uh, I'm there to teach. The, I, it's much more reasonable that they are there to learn. So they will learn from me, but I'm not gonna uh, tell them things. And there, there are no rules to writing, as you well know. And if there are rules, really they're there to be broken. And, and, and I love the ones who come along and, and break the rules in front of my mm -hmm. eyes. But really you have to know some of the rules before you start to break them. And sometimes I, I have students from the ages of 21 up to 60. Yeah. And it's great. I mean, do you remember Frank McCourt? Frank of McCourt, course. The, the great Frank McCourt. Yeah. Uh, he, he Angela's Ashes at, and so he, much more, yeah. He published at the age of 64. Yeah. So he was a young writer, you know? And I know I call it letters to a young writer, but in many ways, Frank was, was, a, was a young writer. Yeah. I, had, I used to have some great times with him, uh, talking about writing out and about, and of course he was, a, he was a great character too. You know, you mentioned Rilke and the letters to a young poet. As I recall, those were written to a specific person. That's right, to one person. Do you have a, did you have a, a reader in mind? Or a... No, I suppose I had my younger self. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, back yeah. in the days when I had hair and, 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 and uh, <laughs> I was typing away and getting all sorts of rejection letters. And what and did you say to yourself? Uh... I said, you better behave yourself. You better learn. Uh, you know, I, I talk in the book about like these romantic notions about drinking and, and, and drug use. I also talk about plot. I talk about characterization. I talk about empathy. I talk about behaving yourself and not yeah. behaving yourself. And um, really, I, I want the, the younger writer to know that she or he is meaningful, that what they have to say is powerful in this world, but they can't come indoors. They can't close the curtains. They can't like uh, lock themselves away from the world and say nothing. Um, you know, the, the, the contemporary writer, it seems to me, I don't know if you agree, sort of works out of a, a more reckless inner need than the writer did 50 years ago. The writer was more of a, a national idea uh, 50, 60, 100 years ago. And you mean we've lost that sense of that connection sense, to the... the sense of connection, the sense of the power, the, the power of the writer. Nobody fears the writer's bite quite the so culture, much anymore. Large, yeah. Although, although the, sweet, the, the, the change in politics has sort of dilated the nostrils of a lot of young, yeah. young writers right now. Yeah. And they, they say, well, okay, maybe what I have to say will matter more in the face of uh, the politics that I'm, up, that I'm up against. That's interesting. I mean, so you do see a sort of energizing or re-energizing, perhaps. Yeah, I mean... But it, to, it, to write connected to what's going on in, in yes. our culture. Yes, although it's dangerous. I mean, a writer's politics can, 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 can get in the way. If she or he has only one point to say, yeah. you lose that sort of 
that, that, that wonderful ability to hold contradictory ideas at the same time. And I think what's important as a writer right now is that we understand that we have to reach much deeper than we were reaching like, uh, you know, last year, five years ago. Mm -hmm. Who are these people that we sort of, a lot of writers didn't recognize, mm -hmm. uh, didn't talk about, uh, didn't access? And how can we tell those stories too? Uh, how can we legislate our own political situation by being nuanced and, and, and muscular with our, uh, our sort of empathy for other people? You know, uh, just to give people a, fla a little flavor of what you're doing, you, you address the old, um, write what you know, right. right? So you say, don't write what you know, write toward what you want to know. Yes. Now explain that. Well, I mean, ultimately you can only ever write what you know. It's logically and philosophically impossible to write what you don't know. However, if you sort of see yourself as writing into a space that you don't always recognize, you sometimes learn things that you knew but weren't entirely aware of. You access levels of consciousness that you weren't necessarily aware of. And that's, it's, it's very liberating for a writer mm -hmm. to go into a space where she or he uh, has not gone before. Because instead of being a tourist, you're like an explorer now. And, it's, and you're sort of, you're lost in this, in this new idea. And you have to find out what it is that you actually do know. And that's what, why I say, those who say you should write what you know are correct. Those who say you should write what you don't know are also correct. <laughs> Another area, character. Knowing your character, details that you won't write about, but right. you know these people so intimately. I, I, I like what you said, not just what she had for breakfast, but what she wanted for breakfast. Right, right, right. right? I call that the, the, the little literary slice of bacon in the morning. Not just what they had, but what they really truly wanted to have. So if you know your character very well, you will, you, you, you will know both of these things. And what does it take for you to get to that point to knowing the character that well? Sometimes it's just like, uh, you know, I do a lot of research. I, I, I love doing research. I lived with homeless people in subway tunnels. I've, uh, I've flown airplanes to write about characters. I've done all these things. Uh, so I try to get in as deeply and engage with the world, um, live my life, out loud, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and find out about my characters. And I like the world. Mm -hmm. I like the people around me. And so, but then I got to go back into my room uh, and close the door, shut my eyes, and try to imagine what it means to be that other person, which is kind of fun because I don't necessarily want to be myself 24 hours a day. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I bore myself to tears. <laughs> well, one other area I want to. Um of the advice structure. You yeah. talk about the organization of a piece of writing and the importance of that. Right. I'm not sure if it's given that much importance for young writers, perhaps, to right. think about organization and structure. Yeah. Well, I mean, a structure can be really problematic. If you have a structure beforehand, you're sort of stuffing your story into a pre-assembled box. You don't want that to happen. What you want in your writing is to have a sort of wildness that occurs, and then out of the wildness, a structure emerges. And then you start, uh, it's, it's really towards the end of a novel that most writers actually say, aha, that's actually yes. how I'm structuring this thing. So you don't want to be too aware beforehand of what it is that you want to say or do. But I mean, that's interesting because that sort of goes to everything you're saying in right. some ways, right? Yeah. You can have all these rules, as you say, and then break them, but uh, how do you know when you've got, say, the structure? I hate to say this, but you know, so much of what I do, so much of what we do as writers is operates on the fumes of a gut feeling. Yeah. And some people think that, but a lot of people think that writers are much cleverer than they actually are. They're no, they're not, but they're emotionally mm -hmm. clever. And, and they get into a character and they feel something, but they weren't entirely aware of beforehand. I know personally, that's, that, 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 that's how I operate. And what about when you're, how do you know when you're encountering good writing yourself? You know, because when you walk outside and you're about to be hit by a bus and you get, which I call the bus theory. <laughs> the bus theory, yeah. If, 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 and, and, and the bus misses you, you say, thank God, because all I want to do was finish my novel before the bus hit me. Listen, when I finish my novel, the bus can hit me all at once. And that's when you know you're doing something, something relatively good. <laughs> I, 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 I want to go back to this larger question of the engagement with the larger culture. Because right. it's been a, 
kind of discussion in American writing for a long time, right, right about how engaged writers are or internal, you know, too internalized at different times. Right. What do you see? What do you see today in, in, especially in the younger writers that you're dealing, that you're working with? Personally, I mean, I like the social novel. Um, I like writing that, that, that gets in and gets under the hood mm. and looks about w at what's going on. But I don't say to any writer that that's absolutely what mm. they should do. I mean, it's like the difference between Whitman and Dickinson, um, Emily Dickinson. Whitman was big and expansive and engaged and political and, and democratic and, and, and wrote beautifully. When Dickinson was, came indoors, it was small and, and intimate and, 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 and whispering in your ear, both incredibly powerful. Yeah. So I don't call on any writer to be social. I don't call any any writer to be political. Uh, but if they do, I'm 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 kind of happy when I see when I see the students that I teach sort of ripping it up a bit, um, shaking our comfortable balance. I like I like the idea of knocking your reader off his or her feet for a little while and saying, Hey, hold on a second. The world is not quite as mm. steady as you as as you think it is. Just in our last minute or two, I want to talk about something I know about that you do, your organization called Narrative 4. Yeah. It's a story, it's a storytelling exchange program. That's right. Just give us a brief it's description. It's a global nonprofit story exchange where we get ki primarily kids from all over the world, from the West Bank, from Ireland, from Israel, from Rwanda, from South Africa, from South Side of Chicago, from Washington, New York, together. And what they do is they step into one another's shoes. So you tell my story, mm -hmm. I tell yours. Mm -hmm. You tell me something that's important to you, and I, and I say it back to you. So I become Jeff. And, 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 and when that happens, your story becomes deeply, deeply valuable. Uh, and and it, it sort of shatters stereotypes and boundaries. If you can imagine a young girl in Paris um, sharing a story with a kid from the south side of Chicago, and that kid from the south side of Chicago has to say, hi, I'm a Muslim girl, and this is why I wear a hijab. Mm -hmm. Suddenly what you do is you expand the lungs of the world. It's about understanding, and we call it narrative four because narrative for peace, narrative for engagement, narrative for the end of bullying, narrative for Chicago, narrative for yeah. wherever it happens to be. And, and why, why do you do it? I do what it, does it because give you? I give something back. I believe in empathy, not as some sort of airy fairy storytelling like, uh, kumbaya moment, but I think stories can be dangerous, stories can be powerful. And, and I think that w w once we understand the stories of others, we become bigger and most likely better people. All right. Letters to a young writer, Colin McCann. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.